I don't know. The Irish cream sounds good, huh? What's that? Uh, it's cream and it's, uh, it's Irish. Hurry up and order! Excuse me. Thank you. Um, how about a smoothie? What's in that? Smoothie's a juice drink. We want coffee. Buddy, relax. No, you relax. I'm a regular here. This line needs to move. I beg your pardon. Do you have scones? Tall, non-fat, double latte. Sir, you're at the back of the line. I recognize that. Cut it out or you're out of here. You can't kick me out. You know what? You're, you're really invading my ear space. Look, I'm a frequent coffee drinker. I'm part of the club. I have a card. Do you have a card? Do you have a card? No, I don't have Does a card. Does anyone here have a card? We don't have frequent drinker cards. That's a video club card. Ah! Zip it there, Sporty Spice! Are we doing this? Oh. Is this happening now? Yeah. Come on, Sorry. I'd Let's love do to. Let's do it. Oh, you're hurting me! You are hurting me! Back quite a few years ago, I took a trip with one of my daughters to New York City. In fact, uh, when my kids were younger, I have four daughters, when my girls were younger, from time to time I would take them on trips like that, whether it was New York, Chicago, uh, actually one time to California, and uh, we'd leave my wife behind. Debbie would stay at home because inevitably there, we have four daughters. There was a couple that wouldn't be coming for various reasons. Uh, and these were really wonderful moments for me as a father to be actually take one or two of my girls and to take them somewhere and just for two, three days enjoy our time together. And so I had taken a couple of our girls to New York City pr uh, previous to this particular occasion. Uh, but my daughter, Grace, who's my third daughter, at the time she was about 12 years of age, she had not gone. And I can't remember the reasons why some of the others were not available, but Grace and I decided we were going to go to New York City for a couple of days. And it was in the summertime, and so she was on break, and so this was something that I was looking forward to. She was very excited about it. Um, and this time, instead of driving, which I had done previous in the two, three times I'd gone to New York City, I'd always driven... I thought it might be interesting to do something different. And so we decided to take the train. Now, I had never taken the train to New York City before, but uh, we decided that this would be kind of a cool thing. My daughter was excited about going on a train. You know, she'd never been on a train before. And so uh, I looked into it, and there is a train that runs from Toronto to New York City. I think it's once a day, if I'm not mistaken. It's called the Maple Leaf, and it's run jointly by VIA and by Amtrak. And so in the Canadian portion, it's VIA, and once you cross into the American side, it's Amtrak. And so this was all very exciting, and it was so, supposed to take about 12 and a half hours to get there, which is about the amount of time it takes to drive to New York City. And so I thought, well, this will be fun. It'll be different, be relaxing, it'll be exciting. So the day came, we got down to Union Station, everything was going fine, we got on the on the uh, train, we found our seats, we were told there was a food car that you could go to and you could buy some food and bring back if you wanted to at any point during the trip. And we set off, you know, and the bell was ringing and we're pulling out of Union Station and that's all kind of a cool thing. And we started our trip. Uh, everything was going well until we got to the New York City or the, sorry, the Niagara Falls crossover, which is what you see on the, on the screens in front of you right now. There is a bridge that the trains cross over uh, at uh, Niagara Falls. And we crossed over, and that was very cool because you could look down and see the Niagara River, etc. But when we got to the other side, what we didn't know is that we would be spending a lot of time parked on a side rail just across on the American side. Uh, so when you cross over, at least at that point, uh, when we took the trip, they actually shunt you off onto a side rail, and we were backed up, and we were looking at a wall that was about one foot from our beautiful picture window. And this is where you go through American customs. Now, this was only a few years after 9-11, so I don't know if it's the same today, but everything was kind of heightened, obviously, at that time. And, uh, and, and so on came the actual armed, um, you know, American customs agents, and we were all told that we needed to stay in our seats. We were not to use the washroom. We were not to go to the food cart. We were to stay in our seats until everybody had cleared customs. 
Now, this is a large train, so you're talking about quite a few people on this train. And, um, well, I, I don't know how to put it other than just to tell you, we were there for two and a half hours, sitting on the side of the track, looking at a wall for two and a half hours. Now, um, I'm not the most patient person. Uh, I try to, but can you imagine sitting there in a seat, not able to move, looking at a wall with your 12-year-old for two and a half hours on this? Well, she was getting quite antsy. I was getting antsy. Everybody was getting antsy. People were getting up and being told to go back and sit down. It was a little bit tense, and I was getting more and more impatient. Anyway, after we cleared custom, two and a half hours, we got back going. I thought, okay, okay, you know, it'll be all right. But when you cross into the American side, there's another thing they don't tell you, and that is that freight trains have the right-of-way. And in a large stretch, large stretch between, New, uh, between Niagara Falls, New York, and New York City, there's only one major rail corridor. So we found ourselves time and time again shunted off onto side rails, stopped, waiting for 10 minutes, 15 minutes for freight trains to barrel by before we could get going. This was going on and on through the trip. And I'm getting more impatient. My daughter, she's kind of losing the charm of the train. Like, why, Dad, didn't we drive? I'm thinking the same thing. I could have walked and it would have been faster. In fact, at one point, uh, the fastest the train went, they had a, a speedometer on the train wall there in the car. I don't know why. It was kind of embarrassing. If you've been in Europe, this is very embarrassing. Um, and the fastest it went was 62 kilometers an hour. So uh, can you imagine 62 kilometers an hour was when we were barreling towards New York City? And I am thinking this was a mistake. This was a big mistake. And the problem is we got to come back this way, right? So anyway, so this was not exciting. So what happened is we finally got into New York City. We pulled into Penn Station. It wasn't 12 and a half hours. It was over 16 hours long to go from here to New York City. I could have flown to Paris and back in the same amount of time it took us to get actually to New York City. To say that trip was a test of my patience would be an understatement as there was so much waiting involved. But here's the point. The knowledge of the fact that my daughter and I would have a cool time when we eventually, if we ever did, get to New York City. That this would be a wonderful experience for her and for me as a father and daughter to have this time together. And she would get to experience the Big Apple. That kind of kept you from losing it and having a Will Ferrell moment like we saw in the video just a moment ago taken from the 2005 movie Kicking and Screaming. In other words, keeping my sights fixed on the good things that were going to come allowed me to endure the challenges involved in the journey to get there. This morning, we're going to continue our current Sunday morning study series that we're focused on this summer called Heroes of Faith. And through this series this summer, what we're doing is we're trying to come to a better understanding of how we can live our lives, those of us who are in Christ, live our lives more fully in faith. In other words, live a life of faith, a life that would honor God, a life that would be to His service. And our primary passage in this series is Hebrews chapter 11. If you have a Bible, I invite you to take it and turn to it, Hebrews 11. Hebrews 11 is known as the Hall of Fame or the Hall of Faith. Because in Hebrews 11, what you find are you find these biblical characters who exemplified what it means to live by faith in the in the face of the challenges that they were confronted with, their ability by God to live by faith in God, to trust God, and to live in a way that would honor Him. To date in this series, we've discovered that a life of faith in God is characterized by confidence, commendation, and obedience. And today we're going to add to that list the virtue of patience. 
when we talked as a staff about dividing up the subjects for this summer, because we're all sort of taking turns uh, sharing with you this summer, nobody wanted this topic. Nobody. Everybody said, well, I can't talk about that because I struggle with patience. And so somehow I ended up with it. In fact, I had avoided it because I was supposed to speak last Sunday. But then Steph pulled a fast one on me after agreeing to do patience. He grew impatient, and he said he couldn't do this week. And so we ended up having to switch. And so he got to talk about Abraham, the father of faith. And I was very jealous of that as I sat over here and watched him last Sunday. And I am stuck talking to you about patience. And uh, anyone who knows me would find that quite humorous. But here's the deal. I'm actually quite excited about it. I wasn't when I started prepping. I've got to be honest. But I am actually now because we're going to talk about patience in a very different way than what you're thinking. And in fact, we're going to talk about patience in a, in a manner that I think is very important for us, and we very seldom talk about it. So I'm excited to share with you this morning from God's Word. Our text today is Hebrews 11, verse 13 to 16. It reads as follows. All these people were still living by faith when they died. They did not receive the things promised. They only saw them and welcomed them from a distance, admitting that they were foreigners and strangers on earth. People who say such things show that they are looking for a country of their own. If they had been thinking of the country they had left, they would have had opportunity to return. Instead, they were longing for a better country, a heavenly one. And therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. Immediately prior to this text, the author of Hebrews has been writing about the exemplary nature of the faith of Abraham, Sarah, Isaac, and Jacob, of which he will return in the coming verses. But at this point, he pauses to underscore some key lessons about their waiting for the fulfillment of the promise of a future heavenly home, lessons that I think we also need to learn. And some of what I'm going to say this morning is going to trouble you, but I hope by the end that we'll all end up in the same direction. But I think this is something that we each need to learn. So the first principle that we find here in our text this morning is this. The first principle for living by faith that the author of Hebrews highlights is that these heroes of faith of old didn't receive in this life the fullness of what God promised them, but they saw and welcomed that promise from a distance. In other words, what God promised them, they did not know in its fullness in their life here in the world as they lived out their earthly life. But they could see by faith that one day they would experience that fullness. Back in 2004, the pastor of the largest church in North America, a man by the name of Joel Olstein, wrote a best-selling book called Your Best Life Now. Let me just say that again. Your Best Life Now. In this book, this health and wealth prosperity gospel preacher offers seven steps for living your full potential. The underlying message is, if I can abbreviate. The underlying message is that God helps those who think well of themselves so that if you imagine yourself to be a winner, someday you'll be a winner. Uh, I've simplified it a bit. Um, visualize yourself living in a big house and driving a Porsche, and one day you'll find yourself with both, and when you do, you'll be living your best life now. Doesn't get better than that. Now, I'm a car guy, and I'd love to have a Porsche. Um, and for a moment, I might think it wouldn't get better than that. But uh, that's sort of the, the intent or the, uh, the, the uh, direction of that book. Now, apart from the fact that such blatant self-centered meism is completely contrary to the true gospel, where we're called to live our lives to the glory of God and the service of our Lord Jesus Christ, the idea that we as believers can experience our best life in this world is nothing short of being delusional. That's completely delusional. You and I in Christ will never know our best life now in this world. Our best life awaits us. Notice again 
that our text begins with the clear statement that all these people were still living by faith when they died. They did not receive the things promised. In other words, they did not receive in its fullness what God had promised to them. They only saw them and welcomed them from a distance. Now, as I previously have mentioned in our study in this, uh, in this chapter, Hebrews 11, the original readers of this text were most likely Jewish Christ followers living in ancient Rome who were being persecuted for their faith. <clears throat> in other words, they were not enjoying a good time. They were under the gun. They were coming under persecution. They were being victimized, as it were, for their faith in Jesus Christ. In an effort to encourage them to stay the course despite their struggles, the author of Hebrews reminds his readers that genuine saving faith is ultimately about having a confidence in what we hope for beyond death not our experience in this world. Now, right away, some of you are getting a little bit nervous because you're starting to think, now, wait a minute, though. What, what, I mean, isn't our life in Christ in this world meaningful? Isn't there value to that? Is, is this all just kind of a waste? I'm not saying that living in relationship with Jesus doesn't make everything about life in the present better because it does but what I'm saying is that the life that we live in the present in Christ is not always what you and I expect or, if we're honest about it, what you and I want. God's best is sometimes quite different than what we would say is best. But even in addition to that reality, that our best life is yet to be lived. Because the fullness of the promises that we have in Christ, like the heroes of faith of old that are highlighted in Hebrews 11, will not be experienced in this world to the fullness, but will be experienced in heaven when we see the Lord Jesus Christ face to face. As those living in the wealthy Western world, we can easily become caught up in the prevailing pursuit of pleasure, possessions, and power. But let us never forget as those in Christ that God has promised us a glorious future, not a glorious present. In fact, if you read through the Gospels and you listen to what Jesus says about the present experience of our life as those who are his followers, you would perhaps grow a bit discouraged. Because we're warned that our life will be full of trouble. We're warned that if they persecuted the Lord Jesus Christ, then they will persecute us. And so, my friends, here's the point. In the midst of the world in which we live, where there's all the shiny trinkets and there's all the toys and there's the vast wealth that we enjoy in the West, we need to be careful that we don't think as those who are in Christ that this is as good as it gets. That that this is the fulfillment of all the promises that God has for us. No, it's not. The fulfillment of the promises that we have in Jesus Christ come when we see him face to face and we're in his presence. That's when it will come. Apostle Peter reinforces this principle when he writes these words. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope, notice that, through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance, future, that can never perish, spoil, or fade. This inheritance is where? It's kept in heaven for you. It's kept in heaven. Who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. In all this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, now listen, you may have to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. These have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith, of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. 
Though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. For you are receiving the end result of your faith, the salvation of your souls. You see, our present life as believers is to be full of inexpressible joy that a sure and certain hope in Christ offers to us. But we don't in this world experience the perfect health, holiness, and happiness that we will experience one day when we are in the presence of our Lord. However, even as our text tells us it was true for the heroes of faith of old, the exercise of faith enables us in the present to see and to welcome those blessings that we will one day fully experience. Faith allowed the heroes of old to see that which they had not come into the fullness of experience of, and so is true of your life and my life today, where by faith we can see something of the reality of what it will be like when we experience the fullness of our salvation. We've all probably had this experience when you go to the airport, which is a place right now you do not want to go, right? When you go to the airport and uh, you're waiting to pick up a loved one, it could be your mother, your father, your wife, your husband, it could be one of your children, it could be grandchildren, it could be a dear friend. And you're not picking them up at the drive through you know, where they come out. You're actually going into the terminal and you're waiting in the terminal for them. You're going to help them as they arrive with their luggage. And, you know, you're excited. You get there, you're longing to see them, and you're waiting. You know, you're standing there with other people waiting. And then you see on the screen that their flight has actually come in, and that heightens your enthusiasm. Okay, they're here, they're here, and you're waiting to see them. You just can't wait to see them, to welcome them. And then you catch a glimpse of them. They're, they're out there, over there, behind all the security. They're going through security, and you catch a glimpse. There they are, there they are. And you see them there, and you're, you're excited to see them, and you want to welcome them. And finally, the sliding doors open, and they come out, and they're looking, you know, for, for somebody to, to recognize them. And you're connected again with them. Well, friends, that's the sort of... That's the sort of uh, of reality that we who are in Christ can experience when it comes to seeing what will be ours in the future, in the fulfillment of all the promises God has given to us. By faith, we can see that we will be in the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ, that we will enjoy the splendor of our heavenly home that he has gone to prepare for us. By faith, we can see it and we long for it. Do you ever long to be in heaven? You know, in some, in some circles, that would give rise to concerns that perhaps pastor needs to see a counselor because he's longing to see heaven. Do you ever long to be in the presence of the Lord Jesus in heaven? That's a good thing to long for because that's when you will experience your best life. In Christ. You know, sometimes I have that experience. I, I have that experience when I'm doing funeral services, particularly when I'm doing interment services for a person who's a, uh, one of uh, God's children, a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. And when I'm standing there and I'm saying what I'm saying, I'm at times filled with a, a sense of envy because I'm thinking of what they're experiencing. And I'm thinking, I want to experience that. How come they got to experience it? No, I, I don't do that. But I want to experience that. There's a sense of overwhelming desire to be there and to leave this world behind and to be in the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. First principle for living by faith we find in our text this morning is that even as Abraham and his family didn't receive in their lives in this world, the fullness of God's promise to them, we also don't. And that reality helps us manage our expectations this side of heaven so as not to grow impatient and disillusioned, even as by faith we see from a distance those future realities that Christ has promised. 
Second principle, which is on the screen, of those living by faith that we find in our text as we look at the example of the heroes of faith is that they lived as foreigners and strangers in this world while looking forward to their heavenly home. They lived as foreigners and strangers. As those anticipating by faith the future blessings of life in the city whose architect and builder is God, these heroes of faith could not feel entirely at home in this world. Do you know that feeling? They recognized they were foreigners or strangers in the world in which we live. They recognized that at a certain significant level, they as members of God's chosen people were outsiders in this world because their true home was in the next. Our text puts it this way. All these people were still living by faith when they died. They did not receive the things promised. They only saw them and welcomed them from a distance. Notice, admitting that they were foreigners and strangers on earth. People who say such things show that they are looking for a country of their own. If they had been thinking of the country they had left, they would have had opportunity to return. Like these heroes of faith, like our Lord Jesus himself, we as those in Christ are to live our lives in a very real sense as strangers in this sinful world. In other words, we're not to become so enamored with life in this present world that it becomes that which most influences our choices, determines our priorities, and becomes the focus of our pursuits. That is not the life you and I have been called, called to as those who are in Christ. Peter puts it in 1 Peter chapter 2 this way, I urge you... As foreigners and exiles, to abstain from sinful desires which wage war against your soul. That is who we truly are in Christ. Foreigners and exiles in this world. And that's because we are no longer foreigners and exiles to God. Apostle Paul says in Ephesians 2, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, he's talking about in relationship to God, but you are now fellow citizens with God's people and also members of his household. Though once strangers to God, and as such we were excluded from heaven through faith in Jesus Christ, we are now strangers to this world and we are waiting to enter our heavenly home. Now, some of you are probably concerned once again. You're saying, yes, but wait a second, but, but we're left here for a reason. And, and is this all just a waste? And, and should we not care about the world in which we live? And the answer to all of those is, well, of course we should care. Because God has left us here for a reason. And we're here to honor him and glorify him and serve him. And we're here to be a witness of the gospel so that others can also have a heavenly home and come into life in Christ. Of course we're to care. Jesus Christ told the parable of the Good Samaritan for a reason. That we who are in Christ are to be the Good Samaritan. We are as we can meet the needs of people around us. That is how we, how we express our worship and our love for the Lord Jesus Christ. We have been called to love our neighbor as ourself. And so I'm not saying that we escape those responsibilities and those privileges and opportunities in the world in which we live. Of course not. That's not the Christian life. We're called to care. We're called to make a difference. We're called to be concerned about the social injustices in the world in which we live, starting here in our own city. We're called to be engaged. And as a church, this is one of our desires. And as we move forward, we want to be more engaged. Of course we are. I'm not saying escape, go hide yourself away in some hole somewhere in the ground until the Lord takes you home to be with him. That's not what we're talking about. But my friends... We're called to live in that way, a life of care and concern, a life of commitment to the well-being of others because we are citizens of heaven. 
because our lives have been changed and we have come into a relationship with Jesus Christ and this is no longer our home. We have a home in heaven and because of that reality, we are motivated to be the ambassadors of our Lord, to be the witnesses of our Lord within the world in which we live, in the lives that we have been given, to honor him. Even as we wait to enter into, as the writer of Hebrews puts it, a country of our own. Even as Abraham and family left Ur of the Chaldees in Mesopotamia and by faith followed God in obedience never to return, despite the challenges and the obstacles that they faced because they were looking forward to a new home that God had promised to them, we who are in Christ are also to keep our deepest longings and our most fervent hopes fixed upon God's kingdom of which we are citizens by God's grace. We are no longer citizens of this world. We are citizens of heaven. Now, you know, I count it a great privilege to be a citizen of this country. I'm a Canadian citizen, as many of you are. I was born here, raised here. And uh, it is a great privilege, and it's something I thank God for. The freedoms that we enjoy here to do even what we're doing this morning, as Shelley reminded us before we went to prayer the freedom to vote, the freedom to uh, make a living, the freedom that we have to travel, the beauty of the country we live in. If you've had opportunity to travel across this country, if not, I'd encourage you to, the splendor of this nation, the mixture and diversity of the people of this country. I could go on and on. We are blessed, and as a Canadian citizen, I am so thankful for that. But ultimately, my citizenship is not in Canada. I belong to Jesus Christ, and my citizenship is in heaven, and my home is in heaven. Even though I have a home here in Toronto, that's not my real home. That's not my ultimate home. And friends, we need to remember that. Do not allow this world with all of its, of its enticements to take your eye off of your home. Recently, we've been learning a new song called Home about heaven, and it's a good thing for us to think about heaven and to long for heaven and to look forward to heaven, and we don't do it enough. And the reason, and I just say personally, is because we get so trapped into this world and all of the trinkets and the toys and the bright lights, the sparkly things, and we forget that our best life is yet to be experienced. The third and final principle of living by faith we find in our text this morning is that the heroes of faith of old lived lives God was willing to identify himself with. Living each day by faith is a life in which we seek to faithfully follow God because we trust him and a life in which we enjoy fulfilling fellowship with God because he is always with us through his indwelling spirit. However, as wonderful and as meaningful as such a life is in the present, there is also a sense of longing. One might, one might call it a quiet frustration for something better. And that's the way it should be. You, as a child of God, have been blessed you have come to know Jesus Christ as your Savior. You have been forgiven your sins. The guilt has been lifted from you. You have been free from condemnation. You have the presence of the Holy Spirit with you who empowers you and guides you and directs you. You have all of the blessings that you have in Christ that you are experiencing in this world. But guess what? There's more. And we know there's more because we've been told there's more in God's Word. And we long for that, and there's a certain frustration that we can't experience it yet. We still have to deal with the encumbrances of sin. We still have to deal with those, those things that haunt us, that come out of the shadows and try to take us down and out of service of the Lord. We're still dealing with all of those realities, personally and within our society and our world. We're still dealing in a world with, filled with hate and greed and lust and pride. 
and we long for a world in which those things will not be a reality. That's heaven. That is our home. And so we who are in Christ, we have this very interesting experience where we are experiencing the love and the grace and the mercy of God every day, and we love and we are so grateful for that, and it's transformed our life, and yet we know there's more, and we can't get there yet. That reality is part of the hope for the kingdom of heaven that God has placed in our hearts as those who are his own. Paul talks about this longing. Over in 1 Thessalonians 1, where he says this, You turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for his Son from heaven. And then again in Romans 8, Paul says, We ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit groan inwardly as we what? We wait eagerly. That's interesting. What a term. Waiting eagerly. Okay. What are we waiting for? For our adoption to sonship, the redemption of our bodies, for in this hope we were saved, but hope that is seen as no hope at all. Who hopes for what they have already have? But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. Notice that word? Patiently. We wait. We groan. We long for the fullness of our salvation. We wait for the Son from heaven. We wait eagerly for the adoption of sonship, the redemption of our bodies. Waiting is not something most of us do well because it requires patience. But that's the point. Yes, we will wait eagerly and we will long for the reality of our fullness, the fullness of our salvation but we need to do so patiently, knowing that it will come. This is our present reality, waiting eagerly, but by faith patiently. As we who are in Christ increasingly learn to live out such a life of faith, that, uh, in our Hebrews text tells us God's response. Notice verse 16. Therefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. That's cool. Here, these heroes of faith were waiting. They were longing for the promise of fulfillment that they would not experience in their earthly life. And because they had such faith to wait eagerly, to wait patiently, with full expectation, God was not ashamed to be associated with that faith. God said, that's the type of faith I want. That's the type of faith that I'll identify with. That kind of faith. Because Abraham and his family demonstrated such patient faith, looking ahead to one day experiencing the fullness of the promises God had made to them, God was not ashamed to call them their God. In fact, God proclaimed to Moses later, he said, quote, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Is there any higher honor than to have God say that he is your God? And if you are in Christ, that's your privilege. I am the God of Alan. I am the God of Enid. I am the God of Tom. I, I better say Shelley, too. I am the God of Shelley. I am the God of Steve. Is there anything more spectacular than that? that that god would identify himself with you wow and he's looking for that kind of faith patient expectant eager faith for your best life ever which is yet to come well, we already possess every spiritual blessing in Christ, we do not yet experience the fullness of these blessings. In one sense, we are already adopted, redeemed, sanctified, and saved, but in another sense, these experiences are not yet fully ours. And therefore, we live for now in what is often referred to as the overlap of the ages 
And yet, as we do so, by faith with patience, God is proud to call us, us his own. Do you know the reality of that in your life? Where you know Christ and you enjoy his presence and you enjoy his comfort and his guidance and all of those things, but you're so, much e- you're so eager to know more, to see him face to face, to know the fullness of your salvation, to leave behind the struggles of living in a sinful world and to worship him in that way, in the fullness of the reality. Some of you know that uh, Debbie and I moved into a new home after living just very close uh, to the church facility for 28, 29 years. Uh, We moved to a new home uh, just over about a year and a half ago or so. And uh, we decided we'd do some renovations. And some of you have heard a little bit about this. And uh, so we, uh, we had an architect come in and a designer, and we decided we were going to do some changes to the uh, upstairs level and taking out some walls and things like that. And, um, uh, and we were supposed to have that all done in four months, three to four months. And um, guess what? It's not done yet. It's been now over a year and a half, uh, and it's not quite finished yet. And so uh, it's been a bit frustrating, to say the least. In fact, uh, Debbie and I uh, slept in the basement study for a year uh, because part of the area that was being renovated was our our bedroom upstairs. Uh, Fortunately, we are out of that now, and I've I've sealed that door off, and we're never going into that room again. But, uh, But here's the reality. In the midst of all of that stuff, COVID and costs going up and contractors not being able to get materials, all those things. I kept looking at that plan. I kept looking at that plan. I thought, this plan, it's going to be good. It's going to be good. It's going to be worth it. And I get a little bit impatient. I get the plan out again. Okay, let me see that plan again. Yeah, it's going to work. I think it's going to be a really good addition to what we're doing. As I fixed my sights on the plan, I was able to endure the problems. And friends, that's what you and I are called to do as those who are in Christ. We're living in a world that's full of problems. We're living in a world that's full of challenges. Some of you are going through incredible difficulties right now. And I just want to encourage you in Christ, fix your eyes on the plan. And by plan in this context, I mean the promise that God has given to you. That your best life will not be lived in this world. As good as this life can be, aren't we thankful for the goodness of this life? And we're thankful for the gifts that God gives us. Friends and family and opportunities. Of course we're thankful for those. But keep your sights fixed on the promise. Because heaven's coming. And the fullness of your salvation is coming. And life to the full is coming. And being in the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ is coming. And friends, that's what we need to do. Do not allow yourself to be so entranced by the world in which we live that you take your eyes off the world that God has promised that he's going to give you. Because that, my friends is what will allow you to get through the difficulties of the world in which we live. Because you know, by eyes of faith, you can see the promise. You can see the world that's coming. You can see your life in its fullness in Christ, what it will be. Brothers and sisters, let's be patient and learn how to wait by faith for what God has in store for us as one in Christ Your best life is not now. It's yet to come. And you know what? It's going to be worth it. Hang in there. It's going to be worth it. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity to study together today. And as we've done so, we've taken a look at a topic that often we don't think much about lord we don't spend enough time considering it reflecting upon it and that really is heaven 
the, the home that you have promised to us and the home that awaits us. Lord Jesus Christ, you said that you were going ahead to, to prepare it for us. And so we thank you that you have done that. And one day we are going to enter into the fullness of our salvation. One day we are going to enter into the fullness of life in Christ that we cannot yet experience completely in this world. And so we pray that you'll help us to wait patiently. Yes, to wait eagerly, but to be patient in our eagerness. And Lord, may that patience allow us to work through some of the challenges and the problems that we face in this world. Thank you, Lord, for encouraging us this morning. Thank you, Lord, for the, the privilege that we've had to study your word and to pray together and to worship in song. And now, as we close our service in song, I pray that we may respond out of hearts overflowing with gratitude for the amazing life that you have given to us. Yes, in the here and now, but in its fullness in the yet to come. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.